I don't have time out of personal interest. And uh, it was a very interesting project that he had showed me, and he's put a lot of time and effort into this and doing mapping. Um, so, uh, and also on the line we have Garvis, who's the chairperson for the Professional Development Committee, and he'll be kind of running things because I'm Mickey Dietrich, and I got to drop off here shortly. I got a board meeting starting right now, so I'm going to drop off for a little bit for that and Garvis is going to go ahead and run with things here and um, with that welcome and uh, Nate I don't know if you'd like to provide a little bit more information about yourself and then go ahead and start your presentation. Uh, sure my name is Nathan Berry. Uh, I grew up in the Finger Lakes region in New York State and uh, attended college at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania where I got a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and uh, I've been working for the Federal Aviation Administration ever since on the, the WASP program, the Wide Area Augmentation System, which is uh, an augmentation system to GPS to make it safe to land airplanes. And uh, I grew up going to the Stillwater area for vacations. So uh, that's kind of what motivated me to do this project. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but uh, that's it, Nikki. Did we lose Mickey again? Yeah, Mickey had dropped off to go to the board meeting oh. that he had to attend. Okay. Uh, uh, should, should I just go ahead and get started then? Start going through the slides. Okay. Yes, if you would. Uh, okay. Real quick, Annette, for, uh, for questions and everything, please hold all questions to the end after Nate is done with the presentation. Please use the uh, chat text box down below in the lower right for the questions and then uh, when it's all done, we can answer, or Nate can answer the questions uh, as we go through. So after that, uh, go for it, Nate, and uh, go forward to it. All right. Thanks, Garvis and Mickey for having me. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, <clears throat> just to get started, uh, I wanted to give you a little history and background on the reservoir. Uh, it's located in the Adirondack region of upstate New York in Herkimer County. Um, the, riv the river that was dammed up to form the reservoir is called the Beaver River. Uh, it's in the western region of the Adirondack Park. Uh, originally, the, the, Be well, the Beaver River dumps into the Black River, and the Black River flows through Watertown, New York, providing a uh, municipal water supply to Watertown, and then it eventually empties into Lake Ontario. So the Black and Beaver Rivers were open in 1853 for uh, logging, and uh, about 30 years after that, in 1886, the first dam was built to create the first uh, version of the reservoir. Uh, that flooded about 1,600 acres, which is about a quarter of the current size of the reservoir. That, that was built in 1886. Uh, eight years after that, in 1894, they moved the dam just a little bit further uh, west on the reservoir and turned it into a concrete dam, uh, which bumped up the reservoir another five feet. And then 30 years after that, in 1924, the concrete dam was enlarged for power and flood control, raising it another 19 feet and uh, increasing the reservoir to its current size uh, of about 6,000 acres. It's roughly 10 miles long. Uh, so as far as the dam was concerned, from 1924 on, it was pretty uneventful uh, happenings until 2001 when the state decided to do maintenance on the dam, uh, resurfacing the concrete and everything, and they drained the entire reservoir 30 feet. Uh, that was the first time in 75 years that most of the reservoir bottom had been seen. Uh, <clears throat> so going back to when all the dams were created, uh, when the state originally prepared the lands for flooding, trees were cut down, but not all of the stumps were, were cleared. And then the hills consisting of rocks and soil were left as is to be simply covered when the reservoir was flooded, uh, thus creating all the hazards that exist today. Uh, <clears throat> just my personal background for the area, my great-grandfather bought the property at Stillwater in the 1940s uh, and built a small hunting camp there. He passed it on down to my grandfather, who then handed it down to my father and my aunt and uncle who built a new structure on the property. 
And uh, a lot of my summers were spent growing up there, boating and fishing and everything. So uh, I love the area. It's an absolutely beautiful, predominantly wilderness area. And it uh, definitely holds a special place in my heart. But uh, there was always one drawback <laughs> to spending time up there, and that was the dangers of boating on the reservoir. Uh, the water level changes about 15 feet throughout the year, and rock shoals and stumps are everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> in the past, paper maps have been created by the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, and that was available to campers. Um, there are other modes of navigating the reservoir. You could get a list of general guidelines and visual waypoints on shore uh, that, could, that you could learn from the locals there to keep you relatively safe. Uh, but for someone who didn't live there year round, they, all that was very hard to master. And uh, paper maps, in my opinion, are absolutely impossible to accurately use on the reservoir. So uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, I started hearing rumors that several local residents had laid out simple GPS waypoints to follow, uh, but I could never locate the, that information. Uh, only recently, as a result of researching my project, was I able to locate any of those original waypoints. Um, even with general guidelines or a simple list of waypoints, many people suffer damage to their boats, including uh, Mickey. <laughs> I was holding a conversation with him and he said he's lost a couple props on the reservoir. So maybe some other uh, participants have done the same. But uh, personally, I was always nervous boating on the reservoir. There was always the thought in the back of my mind that it's a matter of when I hit something, not if, and how much damage am I gonna create and will I be stranded out here? So uh, during the trip in 2014 in the summer, I started to uh, think about Google Earth, which I had used for my job on a regular basis. And I started to think about the historical imagery and I realized that I had never gone back to look at Stillwater in that historical imagery. And I was curious if it had anything that showed the rock shoals. And lo and behold, uh, they had, I believe, eight different dates of imagery available in there. And two of them had low water. So that was kind of the start of my project. And uh, the start of my project was very simple. It was really just these first three goals, provide accurate, safe routes to every corner of the reservoir and hopefully never lose another prop or never be nervous on the reservoir again. Uh, so as the project started, I ended up with just a very simple few layers and I started finding more and more imagery and goals. The goals kind of evolved to go along with that. So I moved on and tried to highlight as many of the hazards as possible. I integrated all available online data that I could find. Uh, Another goal was to actually locate all the useful ortho imagery that was out there and, uh, and then kind of make a concise location to access all that data very easily and uh, try to create some guides so, so people can use it on the water if they choose. So uh, like I said, it started out with just Google Earth and the historical imagery included. Uh, if some people aren't familiar with Google Earth, you can open that up and view. They have the most recent ortho imagery available, and that's usually very, very clear. You can almost count the shingles on your roof. But uh, up in the top toolbar in Google Earth, you can turn on historical imagery and roll back dates. Uh, every region is has different dates available. Um, but it's very interesting sometimes because you, you can watch buildings disappear as you roll back uh, through the imagery. <clears throat> So as the project progressed, I moved on to other tools that were a little bit more uh, capable than Google Earth. Uh, I used a program called MOBAC, which is a mobile atlas creator to create a lot of the uh, ortho imagery tile sets. You can take uh, all, all the maps online, I think as most people know are available in tiles. So uh, you can pick a region and download all those tiles and package them up into one concise file. And uh, the extension or file type on those files is called MV tiles, and those are becoming uh, very widespread use in the mobile uh, area. So you can load them up on phones or tablets. Uh, and then one of the other programs that I've been using, QGIS, also uh, supports that MV tile format. So you can load those up. Uh, 
Uh, I also used another program called Global Mapper. Uh, that was very useful in um, in converting um, different point systems or different uh, reference systems for maps. You can uh, load up one point system and convert it to another and, and spit out the MB top files. Uh, and then I also searched high and low for different mobile apps that could support everything I wanted, uh, which included like loading KML data and the MB tiles uh, map data. So once I found these other tools, things started taking off as, uh, as far as like creating uh, more complex layers of polygons to highlight the hazards. Uh, and then creating like an archive of all the ortho imagery on my website and uh, just compiling all the information I could find about the reservoir in one place. Uh, <clears throat> as I started, like I said, as I started out in Google Earth, it was really, that was my only source of imagery. But as I started searching and, and researching, I found out that uh, there's actually a very wide variety of sources of imagery. Uh, I've listed them all here. Most, most of them are government uh, organizations like USGS and the New York State GIS page has just a ton of data on there. I was very impressed with that. And then uh, private companies, including Google and Microsoft with their Bing Maps and MapQuest. Uh, and then I lucked out and got some uh, contributions from my own family who created a very nice home video of the reservoir, which is available on my website. And also, I got a lot of help from some local residents as well. And I uh, just listed a bunch of the different file types that I came up with that were uh, used as sources in this project. So just to give you a highlight for uh, people outside New York State, here's New York State. If you notice, this entire dark green region here is the Adirondack Park. That's about 6.2 million acres. Um, just a huge park and still water reservoirs in the western region, almost southwestern region of the Adirondacks. So just zooming in, this is the uh, northern section of Herkimer County. And you can kind of start, you can uh, start making out the outline of the reservoir. Zooming in further, this is from a tile set that I created. So that's why you have this uh, saw, sawtooth outline here. And uh, just for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna just highlight this area here with the red circle. Zooming in further, you have the public boat launch uh, on one end. And that's pretty much this, this whole region right through here in the Southwest corner is about the only civilization on the reservoir. Everything else around the reservoir is all wilderness, uh, designated wilderness. So you have uh, like the Pepper Box Wilderness, Pigeon Lake, Five Ponds, uh, so the only thing out around the reservoir really is um, the town of Beaver River, which is completely cut off. Uh, there's no road access out there. You can only reach it by boat, snowmobile, hiking, or seaplane. Um, <clears throat> and then the designated 46 designated campsites, which are all primitive campsites around the reservoir. So just to show you, this uh, water level here is near the top of the range of uh, water level changes. It goes from about 1665 up to 1680 feet on a typical year. Um, and this water level here is probably about 1677 or so. So it's near the top of the range. It looks innocent enough. And then you, until you start looking a little closer, you can start making out some of these shoals that are just under the surface and they're everywhere. So moving forward, this is a nine foot drop in the reservoir level. So now you really start to see some of the shoals pop up. You can see how dangerous these are under, once they're under the surface, especially when you're on a boat on the water, you can't see anything, you know, you can't see reflections or changes in color under the surface from a boat. Uh, this is dropping down another three feet. So this is about 1666. You can see the resolution in this one isn't quite as good. So uh, that was the trickiest part with finding some of this ortho imagery is there, there's a lot of imagery out there, but finding imagery that actually was taken at the right time of year when the water level was low, that was very difficult to find and uh, somewhat limited. Uh, so next slide, this is actually, uh, now you're down around 1664 feet. 
This was actually taken from aerial imagery from 1952, which I was amazed was even available on the USGS site. Uh, they had imagery going back to 1940, believe it or not, but uh, the older imagery, it was all higher water levels, so it really wasn't useful to me. Uh, I thought about including that in the site later, just, just for the fun of it, but this one came in very handy. Uh, one, one benefit of orthoimagery for uh, some people that might not realize it is uh, orthoimagery has been orthorectified, which means uh, it's been stretched and manipulated to fit the, the true earth perfectly. So it's accurate enough where you can actually start to perform measurements uh, using the imagery. Uh, so all the imagery that I've included on the site, you, and you can download all the imagery I use for this project, all the imagery is orthorectified by professionals, with the exception of what you see here. This aerial imagery, uh, although it had like a latitude longitude bounding box, it really didn't fit because it had the original framing of the uh, camera film on it. So I actually had to manually rectify this imagery. So when I use this in the project, I kind of take it with a grain of salt or I'll focus in on one section of the reservoir and fine tune that imagery to something that, that I know is uh, orthorectified properly. So um, over a wide span of the entire reservoir, this can get off a little bit. So I'll show you that in, the, in a future demo for GIS. Uh, so in 2001, when they drew down the reservoir, this imagery was taken by the USGS Landsat uh, system, Landsat 7, which is available online. Uh, so this, the resolution is very low. However, it is professionally orthorectified, so I can use it for measurements. And then uh, the home video that I mentioned before, taken by my family, uh, that home video was taken on September 2nd, and this imagery here was taken on September 3rd. So using the two together becomes a very powerful source of data because you can see the high resolution source of the video and all the rock shoals that you see here are the exact same shape. So you can cross-reference them together and really come up with a useful uh, source of data there. Uh, so just going back to the original, all that's hidden under there. So there's a lot to, there's a lot to maneuver around when you're on, the, on a boat out in the reservoir and you really have to pay attention to the, the water levels uh, before, you, before you leave. So uh, going back to the nine feet down system or nine feet down reservoir water level imagery, uh, I took that, th this is the first imagery I started dealing with in Google Earth. And uh, what I did was I started just uh, highlighting all the hazards with my own polygons. So there you, you see the beginnings of that, uh, with the r red being like a high water hazard, the orange being a medium water hazard. And I tried to take all the layers of ortho imagery into account when creating these, these hazard layers. <clears throat> so going back to the 2001 imagery, uh, I neglected to mention that this uh, water level was all the way down to about 1653, uh, so about 27 feet below the high water mark. Uh, so that, that was very useful in creating routes. Uh, and then these are the low water hazard polygons. And I, I, I define on the website, I kind of have a guide on how to interpret all these colors based on the water levels of the reservoir. So uh, I think I say if the water is above 1673 feet, you can probably just turn these yellow layers off and just use the red and the orange for guidance. But as soon as it drops down below like 1670, you should probably turn these back on and and steer clear of those low water hazards. I tried to make it as, as easy as possible for boaters on the water to interpret the data. Um, I don't know how successful I was, but uh, hopefully it'll work out. Uh, just showing you now, here's all three layers of hazard polygons, uh, low, mid, and high water hazards. Then I started building in the route system. So again, I color coordinated everything. Green routes are good down below 1670 feet. Again, the lowest that gets the typical year is about 1665. So uh, 
my thinking is that those green routes are safe year round. Uh, definitely in the summer months when the water is much higher. The yellow routes, I say the water should be above 1670. And then the red, uh, there's a few red uh, routes throughout the reservoir. Pretty much that should be at like high water only, maybe above 1677. And again, I've, I've documented all those values on the website so you can kind of interpret the colors and know where to go in any water height. Uh, I also added in kind of uh, safe zones for water sports. So if you want to water ski or uh, wakeboard or anything like that, you can know where to stay. And then I, I said just any summer water, any summer month water levels on the reservoir are typically safe enough for water sports. So it's not till late fall when it's, it's too cold to, to do any of that where the water drains out enough where you might start uh, getting into a dangerous situation and coming close to these yellow hazards. So growing up, uh, my uncle was always knowledgeable of this area here. We always water skied and, and uh, knee boarded and stuff there. And we would go down this traverse. I'll show you on the, uh, on the Google Earth and QGIS demos. To the left here, off the left side of the picture is another little bay and that's where the dam is located. So, but we didn't know about this or it was too dangerous. And then there's others off the, the uh, rest of the reservoir. So there's the entire reservoir. This is the, again, this is the area I was covering. Here's the dam bay. Uh, the dam is right here that forms the reservoir. And you can see there's other safe zones out across the, across the water that can be used for water sports. Uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the other imagery that I've used. Uh, this picture here was created by a man uh, named Bill Partridge. Uh, during the drawdown of the reservoir, he actually hired his own pilot to uh, take him up, and he mounted camera hardware on the plane uh, facing downward and went out across the reservoir and took all these pictures. If you look closely, you can see that this is actually a composite image that he laid out by hand and uh, to, in order to create a large print. So I think that's about a you can purchase prints of this. I've been trying for a while, but haven't been successful yet, but the prints are 18 by 36. Um, so once I find this, this will probably be my last imagery I use. So I'm not the first person to uh, work on a Stillwater GIS project. And I, I probably won't be the last, I know I won't be the last. Uh, I know of another project that's being worked on as well. Um, in fact, Bill's project here in 2001 wasn't the first project either. Um, uh, and I'll show you uh, the first paper map created by uh, a man named Terry Perkins, who was a forest ranger up in Stillwater for, I believe, 40 years, 35 or 40 years. Uh, he created the first paper map there, uh, which was quite accurate. That was created in, the, I think, the mid-60s. Um, I'm actually amazed how accurate that was uh, for, the, for the tools he had at, at his disposal. Um, and then, of course, before Terry Perkins, a lot of you probably know about Bert Plank Colvin. Uh, he did the ultimate GIS project of surveying all the Adirondack Park. So uh, I think this is a testament right here to how loved this area is by some of the residents and people that visit there, that they're willing to dedicate the time to the uh, projects like this. Uh, so once I created all the data layers and kind of refined everything over time, once I got more and more imagery, uh, I started to provide all this data on, the, on my website. And it's linked there at the top of the, the slide. Um, <clears throat> what I've, I've tried to provide every, anything and everything that I can find. So the, the, the main download is actually a Google Earth network link. So that's just a simple, real small file that just uh, points to a hosted file on my website. Uh, and that allows me to change the underlying data very easily without everyone having to re-download uh, the link. So every time they open Google Earth, it just refreshes the data from my site. And that network link has the routes, the hazards, and the campsites, uh, which I also provide uh, direct links for. So if you're on your mobile device, you can just download the, the data right to your mobile device directly. You don't have to 
load things up in Google Earth and save them into the uh, individual files on your desktop. Uh, in addition to the routes, hazard and routes hazards and campsites, uh, the Google Earth Network Link also has image overlays and 3D hazards. Uh, the image overlays, uh, I took all the drawn maps that I could find from the different government organizations. I integrated those over the satellite imagery in Google Earth. Uh, I found a bunch of topo imagery that I laid out and then uh, some examples of the ortho imagery or raster, raster data that I used in the project. Uh, I also included a download, in the download section uh, links to uh, an MB tile source file for every different type of imagery I used in the, um, in the project. There were a few exceptions, like um, certain dates in the historical imagery of Google Earth I could not find alternate sources for. I think they're, they're pay sources from like Digital Globe or, or some other uh, private company that um, I was not willing to pay for. So I didn't create those files, but mo most of the data is available on the site. Uh, I also created step-by-step -step guides. Again, like I mentioned before, interp interpreting the different vector layers, the, the hazards and the routes and how to interpret the colors and, and how to uh, map those layers onto different levels of the, water, of, of the reservoir level. Uh, I also created a quick Google Earth guide uh, for people that weren't familiar with the program, how to load the data into the, uh, from the project into Google Earth and how to kind of navigate around within the program. Uh, I also wrote up quick guides on how to load the data onto different recommended apps for both Android and Apple. Um, there's some pretty amazing apps on Android. This Locus Maps and Orcs Maps are uh, very, very uh, capable apps. They can load up all the MB tiles data so you have all the ortho imagery offline. Uh, that was very important. Uh, for being out in the reservoir because there, there's no data out there, no Wi-Fi, no, uh, no cellular data coverage. Um, so it was very important to have all the data offline on your phone, ready to go. Um, and then I found an app on Apple called Map Plus that was also very capable. It's uh, very similar to the Locus Maps and Orcs Maps. Um, some of the newer Garmin units, like the uh, Oregon, seri Oregon series and um, Dakota series. They have the capabilities now to load custom maps. Um, it's not quite as capable as some of the Android apps, which are very powerful, but uh, you, I believe you can make them happen. Uh, I have the data on the site. Um, I don't have one of the more recent Garmin units in my possession, so I haven't been able to test that yet, um, but I believe it will work. And all, this, all the data is there if someone wants to give it a try. Uh, I also have a section on the site for depth and fish finders, highlighting some of the least expensive models, for GPS and memory. Uh, that kind of leads into my uh, into my uh, future efforts on this project, which I'll get to in a couple slides. Uh, I also have a guide on QGIS, how to load up all the project data into that. Since all the empty tiles are there, you can load all that up. You can sort them by water level height and um, that's a very powerful tool as well, which I'll, I'll go through in a minute. Uh, also found on the site is just a whole bunch of other information that I tried to consolidate. Detailed list of the imagery used in the projects, campsite information, uh, a list of all my updates to the data and to the website. Uh, I listed, I put a very large disclaimer on my website. Uh, the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, who runs or who uh, who controls the forest ranger service. Uh, the forest rangers at Stillwater, they used to go out and put buoys on some of the rock shoals to try to uh, prevent accidents, but they actually stopped doing that due to uh, liability. So uh, I researched the Garmin blue chart uh, legal statements and stuff and tried to uh, mimic those. And just, you know, everything on the site is for reference only. So if you, if you choose to use the data, uh, you're on your own. <laughs> but uh, I included all the government links to like the USGS uh, sites that are specific to Stillwater, 
local business links. There's a hotel and a uh, general store up there and a uh, couple uh, inns and everything too. So I tried to include them on the site. Uh, news articles and some historical dates. And then uh, there's a bunch of uh, different organizations that pertain to the, the area and, so, and social media pages on Facebook and stuff that uh, have a lot of nice photos and, and other videos and stuff that are nice to incorporate into the site. Um, so future efforts. I talked about the, the depth finders with GPS and memory. One really nice feature about those is you can um, you can collect data as you drive around the lake and you can start uh, building up a data set and you can use QGIS or a couple other programs to uh, interpret all that data and create depth contours. Uh, so you can create your own depth map. Um, I'm gonna let people click on these links themselves. I won't do the desktop mirror for those, but uh, when I initially started researching that project, the first thing I found was this guy's drone boat. And uh, I think it's a guy in Germany or, or Sweden that built his own uh, autonomous boat that can follow paths that you draw out in Google Earth. And it has a depth finder on it. And he used a program called Dr. Depth, which uh, unfortunately is no longer available. But he created contours for a bunch of lakes in his home country. Um, so. I think he spent about six or seven hundred dollars on that drone boat, so I thought that was a little much to spend on, on the, this project. Uh, so I actually kept researching and found the commercial versions. Uh, some of you might be familiar with these. It's create, they're built by a company called Ocean Sciences, um, and a lot of different surveying companies use those. It's kind of an, a, a glorified kayak with electric motors on the back with GPS and depth finders. Uh, so a lot of those are used uh, on a regular basis. Uh, one of the organizations that I discovered use these boats are, is the USGS. However, uh, it depends on what state you're in, whether those local offices, the USGS offices have the boats at their disposal. Uh, so I've researched a little bit more and found out that the New York State uh, USGS, USGS office has, uh, I believe, four boats at their disposal. Uh, most of them are down in the Hudson uh, around New York City, uh, mapping out sediment movement and everything. But uh, the group that was in charge of operating those boats was actually quite excited um, about the prospect of a project on Stillwater. Um, right now, I believe the uh, proposal has been written for Stillwater for the project, but uh, I'm, the outcome is unknown at this point. So of course, it's all dependent on funding. So uh, if it doesn't work out, that's fine. I'll probably I'll resort back to uh, my drone boat idea, or maybe buy my own depth finder uh, that's capable of collecting that data that I need. So, uh, if, if anybody's interested, this video kind of highlights how those drone boats work, and it also highlights uh, uh, an aerial drone that can take your own ortho imagery. So, uh, it's pretty exciting the capabilities of of uh, some of these systems. Uh, again, the capable software to create that those con that contour depth data includes QGIS. And uh, I meant to link a tutorial on here, but if you do a quick Google search, uh, there's a tutorial on how to use QGIS to create depth contour data. And then uh, ReefMaster and Dr. Depth are two other programs. And I think uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, the uh, company that creates some uh, depth finders, they bought ReefMaster, I believe, or maybe they bought Dr. Depth, one of those. Uh, so just one final comment that I want to make, and I'm going to mirror my desktop to show you the project in Google Earth and QGIS. Um, when I first started this project, I was very ignorant of everything that was available out there. And when I really started uh, researching and digging in my heels on the project, I was amazed at uh, how much data was available. And uh, I happened to watch the uh, presentation video from the uh, New York State GIS page. Uh, I believe it was Bill Johnson did a presentation on open data and how prevalent that's becoming and how useful it is. And yeah, that really hit home with me because 
the amount of ortho imagery that's available on all these government sites is amazing to me. And that's not even going into what's available from private companies. Um, it's just very, very powerful stuff. And the, uh, the tools and everything, like the, they're maturing so fast now with uh, open source projects and stuff. It's, it's amazing to me what's capable. Uh, when I think about this project and I look back on it, the extent that I took this project would not have been possible even six to eight years ago. Uh, existing GPS units, they had very limited capabilities for loading complex data sets onto them. Uh, you know, you could do waypoints and, and paths, but that was about it. You couldn't do complex uh, polygons or, or, other, or other such data layers. Um, and smartphones, you know, smartphones were just getting popular six to eight years ago. The iPhone first generation was 2007, which uh, boggles my mind when I think about. And Android started in 2008. Uh, and the capable mobile apps that I've recommended on my site hadn't even been created yet, hadn't even been thought of yet. Uh, so I think they came maybe in 2010 or 11 was when they started to get developed. Uh, so it's, I guess my final message would just be, it's amazing to me what's available out there and how fast things are moving as far uh, from a development perspective. Uh, the GIS uh, area it has a very bright future to it. It's pretty amazing what's, what the capabilities are. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to mirror my screen here and just walk you through some Google Earth and QGIS stuff. Uh, so here's Google Earth. Uh, Garbus, if you could just let me know if this is not working. Uh, if it is, I'll just continue on. So here's the Adirondack Park, the dark green area. Okay. And I've loaded up, this is the uh, networking from my, my website. Uh, loads up the step. And when you first load it up, it just shows up or temporary play. You have to do is right click on it and save to my places. It'll move up into your into the section up here. And that will be available every time you open Google Earth from that point forward. Um, so just to load up some of the layers. There's the entire reservoir from the picture. Um, there's 46 designated campsites across the reservoir, which I've highlighted there. <clears throat> um, image overlays. Here's a, some examples of the maps. Like this one was created by Lewis County uh, in 2011. So it's kind of their own vector, vector map, cartoon type drawn map. And you'll see, you can see that they uh, they actually had recommended boat routes. There are red dashed lines, but again, this was only available for print, so I'm not exactly sure how you would follow that that dotted line using a paper map. It's again, part of the uh, motivation for my project. So that's Lewis County, 2011. The Department of Environmental Conservation created a new map in 2009. Again, with their own, they have a dashed line. And you can definitely tell uh, that these maps were created with some sort of GIS product because as you dial down the opacity, everything really, really matches up closely. Um, so that's 2009 DEC. And then starting in 1968, and then this map was created by Terry Perkins, the uh, forest ranger that I spoke of that lived up there for years and still lives up there. Uh, this was the original map he created with his boat routes. And I, I think the most accurate routes, he came really close to most of the stuff. Um, but if you turn on each of these layers and kind of dial back the opacity, Hopefully it'll all load up here. You can see that there were different sets of boat routes and every boat route is different. So which one do you follow? <laughs> there are just inconsistent boat routes about across. Uh, 
to turn this back on for a second. Um, one of the bugs in Google Earth is you can't see hazard data under a image overlay, right? See how it disappears as soon as the opacity, no matter what the draw order I write up in the code, those hazards will never come, come above the image overlay. So what I did was I gave all the hazards a height. So I have 3D hazards, and I think this is pretty cool to look at. Because it's zooming way in, and pretend you're on a boat, it's like driving through a city or avoiding the buildings. You just gotta. Uh, some of the topo maps that I found. Some of you might recognize these maps. These are like the um, USGS topo maps from the 1950s. We had a, these maps hanging on our wall in, the, in our uh, camp up there. So we always kind of refer back to it when we're planning hikes and stuff. Example, topo maps. There's some others from like the uh, National Geographic uh, topo uh, map version they have that highlights some of the trails and stuff in there. And then I documented some of the just examples of the uh, imagery that I created. So here's the Landsat imagery from 2001. Off all the historical imagery back. You can see that those things line up pretty closely, almost exact. So Google Earth is what I started with. But again, uh, I moved on to other programs, namely QGIS. Uh, this program is really nice because it loaded up all the MB tiles that I created after the fact. And you can actually sort them by um, water level height. Bear with me for a sec here. And you can just work right down through all the imagery. Gives you an idea of all the imagery that was available. And it just works right down through the water levels. That's the imagery that's available on Google Earth. And then you keep continuing down. There's the 1952 aerial photos that I laid out by hand. And there's the 2001 imagery. <clears throat> you can bring up different topo stuff. Very, very powerful. There's the Adirondack Park historical uh, topographical maps. And again, there's all the hazards. There's all the routes and the safe zones. So QGIS definitely makes it easy to just go through. And for any given route, you can zoom in on something. You can just work right up in the imagery heights. Like, okay, what color should that route be? Or what, what color should that hazard be? And how far should that hazard extend? Right? And that's how I built up the data. Uh, I started this project in, uh, I believe, July or August of last year. And anytime I get new imagery, things get refined more and more. So I feel pretty pretty confident in the, in the data layers now and how accurate they are. Um, Again, as the water level goes down below 1670 and, and further, uh, that confidence level drops. But uh, my opinion is it's it's better than nothing. <laughs> and I, I for one, think it's very accurate uh, down to 1670. I mean, this will I think this will keep a lot of voters very safe. So uh, that's it for the uh, for the presentation. If uh, People want to throw out any questions. I haven't been watching the chats to see if any questions have come up. But great presentation, Nate. Really, very, very informative and well used uh, source of data, open source data and uh, other data you've been working with. Uh, thank you. <laughs>